Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Annette Burke Little, and I'm Vice President of the Village's Genealogical Society. Now that may confuse you, <laughs> but we really are here for the meeting of the Villages Chapter, Florida Native Plant Society. But those of us in the Villages Genealogical Society are thrilled that we're able to help our neighbors in the villages by lending your chapter our webinar platform so you can have this virtual meeting today. Now I'll be running things in the background during the presentation, and you can ask questions of the speakers or of me if you have technical issues, um, all you have to do is open the questions box in your control panel by clicking on the little down arrow next to questions. The control panel's on the right-hand side of your screen. And then you type your questions in the questions box and uh, click on send to all at the end. And at the end of the presentation, I will relay your questions to the speakers and they will answer them. And when the meeting is over, you will see a very brief three question survey that uh, your chapter leadership would like you to answer. So please help them out by answering those questions about your experience with this virtual meeting. And so without any further delay, let me turn this over to Mimi. Well, hello, and thank you all for coming. This is an experiment. Uh, when we found out we couldn't have the meeting in person, um, the past president, Steve uh, Turnipseed, asked if we could maybe do a, a virtual meeting. And our secretary, Joe, got right on it. And we practiced. And then she found um, our great friends of the Villages Genealogy Society to let us use their software. And we're very grateful for them to do that. And Annette, thank you so much. You've been very helpful getting us um, started to, to do all this. And today we're going to talk about native bees and honeybees. We had another present presenter uh, scheduled, but they couldn't do it. So we'll hope to have him in a later date. And But you know, we all love our native plants, but we wouldn't have our native plants if we didn't have our native bees. And we all love honey, so we are adding honeybees, which are not native to the United States, actually to North America, but um, they have become very much a part of our society. So I'm going to get started here. I've never done this before, so bear with me. Uh, and we did decide that this is a meeting, but we are just basically going to have our presentation. Uh, we don't know what we'll have in the future. We don't know if we'll be able to be back in April, but we'll keep everyone informed. But native bees are a big part of our lives. Um, we hear a lot about honeybees, but we also have a very important native bees. And there's over 20,000 species of bees uh, worldwide. And actually that keeps going, that number keeps going up and they believe that there's quite a few more. They're still discovering new bees. And North America has about 4,000 species and Florida has about 300 or so and uh, almost 30 of those are endemic. So they're only in the state of Florida. They are really are a hidden treasure and you'll find them in all parts of the country. The only place you're not going to find uh, bees is at high altitudes. They, they can't survive too well there. And there are many different groups. Um, there's this one group is only in Australia. So we basically, some, some people say we have nine groups, but they pretty much believe that we have seven different groups of bees. And here's some pictures of different ones, and we're going to go into detail on some of them. But we have um, uh, many of you are familiar with bumblebees. They're pretty large, and you or probably see those all the time. We have carpenter bees. Many people think those can be quite a pest and they can do damage. There's mason bees, sweat bees, all types of different bees that you will see. And actually I um, found that when I um, built my butterfly garden that I found out that it really is a pollinator garden. So I not only have bees, but I have butterflies and hummingbirds and all sorts of other insects that help to pollinate. So we actually, it's kind of almost a misnomer to call it a butterfly garden. It's actually a pollinator garden. But in America, native bees are in a great decline. And that's um, to, we all are worried about the honeybees disappearing, but there's also a problem with native bees disappearing. And some, they're 
certainly declining because of their uh, habitat. Uh, in this bottom map, you can see that the darker colors are where native bees are in abundance. And if you notice, they're greatly in abundance in the western part of the United States. And there's a reason for that. Um, actually, Florida only has 300 and some species, but and that's because we're semi-tropical and bees actually don't particularly care for that uh, environment. Uh, they're susceptible to a lot of molds and bacterias, and um, sometimes tropical climate is not the best for bees. For instance, out in California, there's almost 700 different species. So, um, but they are declining. They're declining in all parts of the of America, and uh, that is of to be concerned. If you notice, they when they assessed like 14 hundred of them, half of them were declining. And there are a lot of studies and why this is happening. They are getting some diseases from honeybees. They are also losing their habitat. And we have a big problem with uh, insecticides. They, they, help, they hurt honeybees and they also hurt the native bees. Um, interestingly enough, um, that um, there is a great deal of similarities between bees and wasps, but they are different species. And um, they, that's because bees evolved from wasps. So uh, around um, many, many millions of years ago, probably 125 million years ago, when the first flowers appears, wasps are predators. And they may have been hanging out on the first flowers, which were big saucer-like flowers, something like a present day magnolia. And they probably found that um, maybe they needed a drink or they started nibbling on some pollen and they thought that, um, that sufficed and, and they needed a lot of protein for their young, for their brood, but they found that it was an easier way to bring them back pollen than to have to fight off and, and fight with a, a live predator prey. And so they, some of them became vegetarians. It made life a lot easier. Uh, I know I'm a vegetarian. I've been one for many, many years, but that wasn't the reason. Anyways, um, the wasps um, started evolving, and as they evolved, they had to have different characteristics. If you'll notice that a bee is very hairy, and one reason for that is it allows them to carry pollen. So wasps are very smooth and shiny. And of course, like I said, they're meat eaters. They do eat some pollen. Um, but bees are, eat pollen and nectar. They are vegetarians. And they're very efficient at pollinating. They evolved with the native plants. And there's some native plants like pumpkins and blueberries and cranberries that only that are, use bees uh, specifically. And those, especially our native bees because they are native to this country. But pollen is rich in protein, and so they found that they could bring it back to their young. And usually bees are somewhat gentle in nature, especially solitary bees, because they only are fending from themselves. They don't have to bring anything back to a hive. So they're going to be more gentle because their main intent is they need to find food, and they're not really going to bother with um, trying to protect um, anything but themselves. But a wasp and bees. Uh, and some uh, other social bees are a little bit more aggressive. And um, you also can see that when bees are flying, sometimes their legs are more hidden. Now that doesn't mean when they're hovering right near a plant, but when they're flying up in the air. Uh, but again, it's a little hard to distinguish the two. Uh, neither of them want to harm you because usually it means their demise, but they um, can, they can sting. Uh, here's some differences in the the two. You can see up here is the eastern yellow jacket wasp. Yellow jackets are ground nesters and they are, they will swarm on you. I went to Georgia Tech and that was our mascot and I never thought that was a particularly good mascot, but um, they, they are one of the more aggressive of, of these types of insects. And then you have things like the mud daubers, which you probably see a lot of. They're, they're pretty harmless. Um, but if you notice, a digger bee sort of looks a little bit like a yellow jacket, and uh, the nomad bee looks a lot like one. So sometimes it's kind of hard to tell the difference. But usually the hairiness and the fuzziness um, is a big hint for that. These are some pictures of bees that were on my um, Black Eyed Susan last summer. And um, I had great fun taking a lot of photos of bees. Um, you do have to get a little close to them, but I just took these with my camera. 
on my phone. Uh, I wanted to go a little bit over the bee anatomy. Uh, bees are insects and they have three body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And they have very big eyes, which are compound eyes. And they also have these oscillae in the, on the top and that lets them detect motion. So that's why it's very hard to approach a bee. They're gonna know you're coming. Um, they have uh, two sets of wings and sometimes when they're flying, they hook these wings together. So it doesn't look like they have all of those wings, but they do. Uh, one way to distinguish the different species of bees is through these veins on their wings. And even the best of the scientists that study bees can't always distinguish which bee it is. And so sometimes they have to go by the veining in their wings. And they have a, something that's very specialized, especially this became specialized from the wasps, is their back legs. And on their back legs, they're able to carry pollen. And especially the bumblebees and the honeybees have these specialized hairs, and sometimes they call them honey baskets, and they're, uh, excuse me, pollen baskets, and they're able to uh, mix the pollen with their saliva and some of the nectar, and then they're able to carry it back. And here's an example of a bee, bumblebee, that actually has their pollen basket full. Bees also have different characteristics in their tongues. Some have a longer tongue, which allows them to get in the more tubular flowers, but some of them, most of them have more of this short tongue and they have to lap up the, uh, the nectar from the, from the flowers. So they have done a, a symbiotic relationship with plants, and that is to give the plants an opportunity to um, have pollination. Now, there is abiotic pollination, which does use non-living methods, such as wind and water, and it moves pollen between the flowers. And I imagine a little later, Jean's going to talk about, um, when she talks about honey and the pollen in the honey, a lot of the pollination is done this way, and it's done through the wind and water, and this can grow for great distances. But many plants do rely on a living pollinator to move their pollen. And what they've done is they have a clever system where in the bottom of the flower, they'll have a well of nectar and that's primarily what the insect is after. So when they visit the flower, they're gonna have to go down and get brushed by the pollen that's on the anthers of the female, uh, excuse me, the male flower and reach the nectar. And then when they go to the next flower, they'll actually lose some of their pollen and it'll land on the stigma, which is the female part. And then they'll go down and make uh, grab their nectar. And then this is the area where the seeds are formed. And so after the flower fades, the seed pods will develop. And this is thanks to the, thanks to the pollination by the bees. So the lifestyle of a solitary native bee is a little different than a social bee, but we do have many bees that are solitary. And the social bees are more like the honeybee and the bumblebee, and they're the bees that require um, a whole colony to raise their young and provide provisions. And this, um, but many bees are solitary nesters and they will create a nest and they'll go out and forage and get pollen and they'll mix it again with their saliva and nectar and they make this ball and then they'll lay their egg on top of the ball and the egg will have something to eat when it hatches so the larvae can eat the food that's been provided and then the larvae turns into a pupa and eventually an adult so the bee completes a complete metamorphosis. So it's like a butterfly. It actually has all the stages. You could compare this little larva as the caterpillar that you're used to seeing with butterflies. And this is, it's not a cocoon or a, um, but it's got its own little pupa in its, its little home. And then it becomes an adult. Then it'll go out and forage and build the nest and the cycle continues. Now it's a little bit different for the social nesters because they will actually have a queen laying the eggs and then the rest of the nest will go out and forage and they'll tend to the young. So it's, it's a little different of a situation. And, but bees do eat pollen and nectar their entire life, and they also bring some back. So here's an example of a 
ground dwelling bee and it's going out and getting the nectar and then it's making these what they call bee bread which is a mixture of the nectar and the pollen together and these are examples of the little larva that are in little different stages here so this would be like a cross section if you looked into a nest so ground nesting bees um, usually will dig holes and tunnels into the ground and then they'll make these little chambers again with this ball of bee bread and their eggs laid on top. And sometimes ground nesting bees will nest together. In other words, they might be another solitary bee over here. Sometimes they do like to nest in groups. Some bees, it depends on the species. They usually try to find a sunny location and an area that they can um, not get drowned out by the rain. Then we have cavity nesting bees, and um, many of you are familiar with carpenter bees. Those are a primary one of these. Also a leaf cutting bee, and um, they will find cavities that are already made, and they will go in and sometimes they'll feather the nest. Uh, in the case of a leaf cutting bee, they cut a hole in a leaf. I, I've seen this a lot on my roses, where they cut a nice little hole and then they uh, fortify the, the nest of where they're uh, young are going to be. And then like a carpenter bee, now carpenter bees can do a lot of damage and um, that's why they're, people don't like carpenter bees. But usually if they have a place that already has some holes or cavities in it, they're going to prefer that than trying to go into your house and your soffit and make um, their home. So they much prefer this. So that's why it's really good to have some old trees around or some old wood around that they can build their nest in. And they actually make a, a long cylindrical chamber where the, each um, little segment has um, an egg in it. And you can see here there's the eggs developing uh, by the carpenter bee. Here's an example of where they actually did go into a structure and made these different compartments and maybe damage the structure. Although they don't like paint and things like that. So if the wood's painted, they're usually not gonna get into it. Um, this is a story that I love. It's about the Cinderella bee and there's there's this Serotina bee and it's a very small carpenter bee. And um, what happens with the Cinderella bee, it's kind of a sad story, is the mother will lay her eggs and she'll lay quite a few in a column. But the, And her first eldest daughter, she will only give a very small portion of food to. So when that daughter hatches and somehow she makes her way out, she and the mother bee will go out and they'll forage and get food and bring it back to the other solid, the other uh, serotina bees that are waiting. And they don't come out of their chambers. They've hatched, but they don't come out. They wait there. And this is usually in the fall. And so the mother, and the Cinderella bee is smaller because she didn't get as much food, but she's forced by her mother to go out and they bring back food and they feed and fatten up their her stepsisters and get her ready. And then the mother and the Cinderella bee will succumb in the fall. They won't be able to survive over the winter. But um, so she doesn't really have a Cinderella ending. There's no fairy godmother and there's no um, prince. She, But she has fattened up her sisters and they will hibernate through the fall and winter and then emerge in the spring as um, they'll be uh, new new bum, new carpenter bees and they'll go out and they'll start making their own families and homes. So I wanted to talk a little bit just on a couple of the more common native bees that we see here in Florida. Um, we all probably have seen sweat bees. They're very pretty. They're uh, so they have this shiny metallic color. Um, here's the face of one. Uh, they can range in a lot of different colors and behaviors and they're great pollinators. And the reason they're called sweat bees is they tend to like, like all creatures need some salt in their diet and they sometimes will land on humans who are perspiring because they wanna drink the salt from their sweat. Here's a picture that I took in my yard. This is on uh, spotted bee balm, which is a great plant to have, and also some black eyes seasons. Now, this is the largest, the epidee is the largest uh, bee family, and it includes honeybees and bumblebees. And uh, the Latin name for bee is apis. And um, 
the bumblebee is the bombus, which um, means buzzing sound, which you've all probably heard of bumblebee. And they're kind of furry and large. And here's one that I took um, in my uh, passion vine. And you can see it's got a lot of pollen on it. I've also seen bumblebees and honeybees together, eat, uh, finding the pollen in the nectar on the passion vine. And they are a social bee, and they will have one queen and, and workers, and they're not as big, their colonies, and they're not as long-lived. They make nests in the ground, and in the spring, the queen mother, a queen bumblebee, will go out, and she'll create her home and her nest, and she'll forage at the beginning and bring back food. And then as more bees hatch, they take over those duties and create a colony, and then she'll pretty much stay home and lay eggs. And then the um, the workers will do the rest of the chores, but they only usually last one season, so that's different than honeybees. Now, honeybees can't pollinate everything, and they can't really pollinate a tomato plant. Um, it takes a certain type of pollination, which is called sonification or buzz pollination. And what happens is a bumblebee and sometimes some of the other bees, like a blueberry, um, southern blueberry bee, will use this method to pollinate flowers. And what they do is they will land on a flower and they will contract and move their flight muscles, but they won't fly. So that creates um, a buzzing sound and a buzzing vibration and it release the these plants will release their pollen because their pollen takes a little bit of nudging to be released and this is certain flowers like uh, tomatoes cranberries blueberries and eggplants require that now they um, have actually started colonizing bumblebees but again bumblebees don't only live one season but they've artificially found ways to do this and they they bring these into their um, uh, greenhouses and they found that they were doing this and they found that it was over the Europeans had a great method for doing this so they sh imported a lot of bumblebees from Europe and unfortunately they carried some diseases with them and those eventually escaped from greenhouses into the wild and so there are some diseases and bumblebees are in, imperiled right now. This is an example of a southern blue blueberry bee, which actually also uses this sonification. However, if you notice here, a carpenter bee has gone in and made a slit in this blueberry flower, and it's actually kind of poached the pollen. In other words, it didn't have to go in and, and get the pollen dusted on it. It goes in and gets drinks the nectar from the side. And here's an example of a honeybee actually using the hole that the um, carpenter bee had made to also rob some of the nectar. So that's kind of a way of cheating and it doesn't help the plant too well. So these are some of the native bees. Again, we have the blueberry bee and the leaf cutter bee. And this is the serotina, the little small carpenter Cinderella bee. You can see that the southern carpenter bee looks a lot like a bumblebee, but it doesn't have the stripes. It's mostly shiny and black. Now, I wanted to mention a little bit about bee imposters because a lot of flies look like bees. So here we have um, some flies and they look a lot like bees, but they only have one pair of wings. They only have two wings. Their antennas are shorter and their wings rest at, rest at kind of a 45 degree angle. And they have very large eyes and a very round, large head. I thought this was interesting. I found it on the internet and I believe it meant that um, this was for, you know, if the bees are dying and everyone would probably think this is a bee and it's full of pollen and, and flies actually are good pollinators, but this is a fly. You can see it has very short antenna. Its wings are at a 45 degree angle. And um, I just thought it was funny because I believe they thought this was a bee. So um, what can we do um, to help the bees? Well, conservation, um, you can, have a yard that um, is inviting to bees. And, and actually, they're fun to watch. I've enjoyed watching them. You have to watch them a little closer than you do birds, but they can be quite entertaining. Um, so if you make a pollinator garden, you're going to attract bees. You want to have a 
large diversity of sizes and shapes and colors because you want to make food for them throughout the year. This is an example. I think some of you recognize this residence. Whoops, sorry. Um, where um, they have um, a large diversity of plants that are going to attract pollinators. Uh, you don't want to use pesticides if you can help it. And if you do have to use them, please follow the directions and don't use them when pollinators are active. And, um, you know, nobody likes these well manicured lawns. Um, it, it, no insects like them, but you can sometimes have plants scattered into your lawn that are attractive to pollinators and they'll still make them attractive or, or have a native yard. Um, and you can also have um, houses for them. This is in my yard. And if you see down here, it's there's some babies in there. The plugs are on there. Uh, you can make one by using a tin can and straws. Please make sure they're plastic, paper straws and not plastic. And you can plant some wildflowers. So um, Coreopsis and blanket flower are very popular. Black eyed Susan lo bees love that. They love the spotted bee balm, false rosemary, asters bloom in the fall, which is good for them. Um, and um, some of the others, you want flowers that bloom all year. Um, there's many shrubs that are good for bees. Um, my sparkleberry is about to bloom. Uh, Walter's viburnum, elderberry, which is really good. Um, for uh, health reasons, it's it's wonderful. Right now, we have a lot of problems with, and I know some of you have probably seen some bucus, which is from the elderberry. Um, Simpson stopper, saw palmettos. This makes a great honey. Jean will probably talk about that. And even our sable palms are great for pollinators. And we also have what a lot of people call weeds. I like to call them as, um, you know, food for pollinators. Um, but Spanish needle, this was, I, I took this yesterday. This is a honeybee that was hovering around the spiderwort or dayflower. And um, she was kind of angry. I was wondering if it wasn't Africanized because she was saw, she was alone. I didn't see any other, but she was buzzing around and she didn't particularly like me there taking a picture. But uh, she certainly loved this. Um, this, the Florida snow is in a lot of lawns and people don't like it. I think it's beautiful. It, it does look like Florida snow and um, it can be very greatly considered a weed and it can get out of hand, but it's great for bees. And frankly, many of the flowers are very tiny that they nectar on. And of course, in the fall, we have the goldenrod, which um, does not cause allergies. It blooms at the same time as ragweed and ragweed is what's more common for allergies. So goldenrod has gotten a bad reputation. So I think I've talked enough and now it's time to hear from Jean. And Jean's going to tell us about Apis mellifera, the honeybee, which is not native, but certainly very important. So I'm going to leave, take, leave it over to Jean. Hi. Uh, this is Jean, the beekeeper. Uh, I hope everybody can see my slide here. I uh, chose you some pictures of worker honeybees. These are the female workers. And you can see this is a really interesting slide because you can see the fuzz, the hair on the bees, and that's what makes them have stripes. Without the fur or hair, they wouldn't have stripes. So bees without stripes or honeybees without stripes typically aren't real healthy. Hmm. I can advance the slide. Oh, okay, Here, here's the next slide. Um, sorry, uh, I'm new to this too. So um, there I am in a bee suit a long time ago. I'm holding a, a frame of bees. And this shows you uh, the insert at the top right, shows you uh, what's on that frame, um, some brood, some little eggs. If you look in here, there's a little tiny eggs. There's some larva and this is a capped larva that matures into a, a, a honeybee and then emerges and uh, uh when you start beekeeping and here here this slide you can kind of see what you need you need uh, this tool <laughs> the the hive tool you need a yeah, you might need a smoker you don't really need smoker but it sure does help and uh bee suit's really nice so the bees don't sting you but uh pretty much you're good to go and then you need some bee bee boxes and this over here is a really interesting uh, picture of um, of the bees making a queen. These are queen cells. 
So um, here is the structure of a honeybee hive. Now this is a Langstroth hive, designed in the late 1800s by a fellow named Langstroth. And he observed bees in the wild and he said, oh, look at, look at how they look. They look uh, like this lower picture down here. Uh, this is how they make them in the wild. So you know what, I'm gonna build some wooden boxes and I'm gonna structure it exactly like the bees like habits. I'm gonna make sure the spacings are all the same. And I'm gonna make these wooden frames that can be lifted out of the box real easily. Whereas, you know, if you were trying to pick this up, it wouldn't be so hard, easy. But, but when you put the wood around it, then the, you can pick it up and uh, put it in an extractor and, and it stays together. So it makes it easy to work. So, so, so most commercial beekeepers have, have, have implemented the use of the Langstroth hives. Hundreds of years later, we're still using this, this wonderful invention from uh, back in the late 1800s. So uh, don't, this is not the only way though. There are top by hot bar hives and other, other kinds of hives. But if you're a commercial beekeeper, this is the easiest way. You gotta, you gotta stand, you don't want the bees to get wet. So uh, you might wanna put them on cinder blocks. You, you, this is the bottom board. So they got some way to get up in the hive. This is the bottom box is where the queen stays. Now she stays down here and pretty much her whole life. She lays eggs in this thing all day long, 2000 eggs a day. Then you got your queen excluder, which keeps the queen from going up into your honey stores. So the, the queen stays down here, lays eggs, and then the, up here the bees put the honey so that they can harvest the honey without having to worry about uh, having uh, little baby bees all, all mixed up in the honey. Uh, baby bees don't taste so good. They taste good to bears, but not, not to humans. So here, here's a, a honey bee hive. It's basically made up of 50,000 worker bees. These are your important ones, the, the female worker bees. They pretty much provide just about everything for the hive. Now the queen obviously is the most important part of the hive because there's only one of them. And she lays the eggs, which create all of these worker bees. And then you got a few drones. So you got like 50,000 worker bees, 500 drones say, and then one queen. The drones, all they do really is mate with the queen. So they hang around, see he's got sunglasses on, he hangs around and w curls up into the honeycomb and takes a nap, sings some songs. He sings out a key and you can hear him if you listen really, really hard in a beehive and he'll go fly out to his little drone pools and wait for the queen. And if he doesn't see one, he'll fly back about every 30 minutes. He'll fly back to the hive and he'll rest and do whatever, roll over, wait for some of the workers to come feed him. Got a good life until he mates with the queen, in which case when he does meet with the queen, his member stays in the queen. He falls to the ground with all of his guts rot, ripped out of him and um, he dies. So um, that, that's basically your bees. Now the, the worker bees take care of everything else. They build the hive, they forage for the nectar, they nurse the young, they guard the door to make sure that rats and whatever don't get into the hive. They kick out the dead. They, they sling them out the front door through the, the entrance of the hive. They keep the temperature. So they're air conditioners and they're heaters. So the bees provide the air conditioning and the heat, heating for the hive. And they also clean the hive out whenever some you know, debris falls or whatever, whenever a beekeeper, for instance, goes in there and messes around, they take care of the damage that we do. Now, like I said, the queen bee is, is the most important thing in the hive. And uh, she comes, she emerges from a cell that looks like this. Now this is about the size of a peanut. It looks kind of like a peanut. And the, these cells are much bigger. And it's really interesting because the bees put a little drop of royal jelly in all of these cells in this, uh, in the, on this frame. So they all start out with a little bit of royal jelly and they all get royal jelly for the first three days. And the queen lays an egg. She lays a fertilized egg in these because these are all worker bee cells. So these all get fertilized eggs. If I had a frame up here, uh, slightly bigger cells, she would lay an egg in them, they would all be uh, drone, drone, drone bees would emerge from those. You'd put an unfertilized egg in those. Now, so these are fertilized eggs and this one is a fertilized egg, but the difference between this cell and these cells is that these, the, the queen gets only royal jelly. So they cap off her cell, they fill it with royal jelly, cap it off, and then 15 days later, she emerges a queen. And you can see how important she is in this lower side. Look at all these worker bees. They're all like tending to her. They're making sure she's okay. Uh, you know, do you feel okay? Do you need some food? What can we do for you today? You can see this little dot. Now they used to use these little dots on the thorax here to, to note 
uh, how old the bee was. Well, now nowadays the queen, even though she she can live three to five years, right? But nowadays, because of pesticides, she really doesn't because uh, uh, pesticides have really uh, wreaked havoc on the bee population and they don't do as well. She doesn't remain productive for the five years that she, she may have in the past. So after about six months or so, she kind of runs out of steam and, and they, they got to do something. So not a good situation, but but this is a queen and, and, and an amazing, amazing creature because just because she's fed royal jelly for the entire gestation period, she turns into this as opposed to one of these, which is a difference between living 30 days and living years. So um, there, there's the queen, the most important part of the integral part of the hive. They'll do anything to save the queen. Now here's the queen. Uh, she's laying the egg. See, I, here's the royal jelly, probably a little dot of royal jelly here. She lays the egg in here and the, the, the larva uh, matures, uh, they cap it off. And then uh, after so many days, the, the, the worker bee emerges. After a certain amount of other days, uh, if she had laid an unfertilized egg, a drone bee would, would emerge. And then, of course, in a different, totally different kind of cell, if she laid an egg in a, in a queen cell, she would become a queen. So that's the life cycle of the honeybee. Now, here's my brother. Now, my brother is the one who started me in beekeeping many years ago. He was on his way to work, and he saw this little uh, swarm of bees up here in the tree. And he said, oh, I better stop that and bring that to my sister Jean in Florida. Now, he's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, taking this uh, beehive out of the tree. But he's prepared. He's a he's an aeronautical engineer. He's prepared. And uh, you can see the shop back here on top of his van, and he's using that to suck that that hive out of the tree. Now, that's just a swarm. Now, a swarm happens when the, when the hive either doesn't have enough space to put honey or doesn't have enough room to put bees. They'll swarm because they need more room. So what happens is a few days before the new queens emerge from their cells, the um, old queen will fly out with the hive. They starve the old queen for several days. And then once she's thin enough and can fly, they'll fly out with maybe half the hive. And uh, and they swarm up into a tree, and then they go look, and they say, well, where could we live? Well, maybe they could live on that tree limb, but maybe not. So if they decide that tree limb's not good enough, they'll send out some scouts, and they'll find a new place. Maybe they'll find a place, a crack in the, in the side of your house, and they'll crawl inside the walls of your house and make a hive in there. Who knows? Anyways, they'll find a place, and they start making comb. And here's what it looks like when they start making comb on the tree. Now, this actual picture is from from Florida, I took a beehive out of a tree, a ginormous one. It was maybe uh, maybe four, five, six, seven, eight feet uh, in diameter. I mean, it was a huge, 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 tr huge swarm. It took me like four, five, six hours to get this out. I, I, I cut it out piece by piece and put it in a box, saved the hive, took the queen bee, took most of the bees back into my house. But imagine I was up on a cherry picker, maybe 50 feet in the air, and I, and I worked toilet, uh, toiled for several hours to take that beehive out of the out of the tree and here it is but these uh, this swarm here may or may not uh, make this formation up in the tree they may uh, move to someplace else and then start making the comb but uh, this is the swarm of bees that's that started my beekeeping a uh, long 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 time ago and um, one problem with the bees if you notice back in 2006, they they coined the term colony collapse disorder. Now the colony collapse disorder is um, not really all that well defined even to this day. They believe that it's driven uh, partly by uh, the heavy use of neonicotides, which were um, very very prevalent back before 2015, and they started to realize the um, implications the negative implications of spraying so many neonicotinoids on, on agricultural crops uh, in 2015. And, uh, and um, they, they did reduce, it looks like they reduced use of it if you look at, at, at pictures, but neonicotinoids are generally used to, um, to spray on um, the seeds. And I think 80, something like 80% of neonicotinoids are used on seeds, which is a systemic uh, insecticide 
so you can't really like wash it off. And they've realized uh, even today, because there's so much neonicotinoids have been sprayed in our environment, they hang around for years and years and years in the soil and show up in our fruits and vegetables. And there's nothing you can do. You can you can rub as hard as you want. You you're not going to rub the neonicotinoids off of your off of your produce, your vegetables, whatever, because they've been used and, and they've been used it, 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 everywhere. And they've affected the bees. It attacks their nervous system. And, uh, and, and the other, and one, one, one reason we're using all of these pesticides is to get rid of this thing called the Varroa mite. You can see it in this picture here. In the lower, you can see it on a, on a larva. It gets in the larva uh, while the bee is maturing. And, and, and this gives them all kinds of viruses. So hence the reason, you know, that we, we spray all kinds of stuff on the bees to try to get rid of this mite. And then once they get sick, we try to spray more stuff on them to get rid of this, the illness that they get. It's just a, it's a vicious cycle. And here you can see four mites on this live bee here. And, and this is a very unusual picture because if you go in a beehive and try to find a bee with mites, it's very difficult because these mites tend to like to go where the sun doesn't shine. So they'll be crawling around as you're looking at the bees. They kind of move away from the way that you're looking at them. So it's very difficult to see. So this is a, a really interesting picture. But here you can see the heavy losses. Even this year, like last year, we, we don't have data for 2019 yet, really, because the studies are still being uh, formulated. But if you look at 2018, in some areas of the country, beekeepers lost about 80 to 100 percent of their beehives to this heavy use of pest all around the globe. So what can we do? Well, a lot of people ask me, well, colony collapse must be over. We must have figured out, you know, what's going on. We must have fixed it. The bees must not be happening. No, it's not over. It's not over at all. It's still happening. But but what's more important, you know, right now we're all we're all we're all looking at the coronavirus. We're not worrying about this virus or these problems with the varroa mites that started, you know, back in 20. 2006, maybe started even back in the, in the early 90s, because I can remember when my brother was first uh, working with me with bees, he, he was experiencing problems with colony collapse even back then. He would go to his hive one day, it'd be perfectly healthy, and then go back the next, and all the bees would be gone. So it's really been, this whole problem with the bees has really been happening for ever since really, and ever since DDT was introduced into the United States back in the 19, early 1900s during uh, uh, World War II, they invented this wonderful thing called DDT, and they were just spraying it on everything to get rid of the insects. And, and it turned out to be a, a pretty bad thing. But but it, but ever since then, we've we've invented new pesticides and new things to put on our our crops instead of instead of just handling it by planting diversity. If you plant diversity and you give the the um, if you don't plant such a monoculture, you reduce the possibility of having these huge infestations, which created the need for the pesticides in the first place. So if you line your crops with other plants um, that flower and different, uh, give the, the whole environment diversity, then, then you deflect these horrible um, infestations from your crops. And, and you can actually improve your crop yield by, by bringing in your your native bees, you, you really don't need the, the honeybee to pollinate if you had enough of these native bees. And the way to generate them is to, pre, to plant these diversities of crops. Instead of planting your monocultures of crops, you need to get away from that and plant stuff going to help all of us survive. Because these yards with this grass is not helping anybody. It's not helping the bees. It's not it's it's just bad for the environment. So, anyways, you can see here. Uh, um, here's one of my honey stands at a farmer's market. You know, uh, plant diversity. Stop buying from big box stores. Ask them in the big box stores. Ask them at Home Depot. How many of your seeds have been uh, sprayed with these neonicotinoids? Because if you buy plants that have been uh, sprouted from from seeds that have been treated with neonicotinoids you're not going to do anybody any good. In fact, you're going to kill bees because that's, that's what happens. And so we need to get away from that. Another thing that's hurting the bees is this practice of migratory beekeeping, which is bringing a lot of money to the U.S. beekeeper because uh, honey, because honey is so, um, is brought in from other countries. Um, probably 90, 95% of all the honey sold in the United States is, comes in from other countries. It's blended with U.S. honey. They label it made in the U.S.A. And, but but it's killing the United States beekeeper. So how is the beekeeper 
in the United States making money? Well, they make money by being a migratory beekeeper and tracking their hives out to the almonds every year to go and and, and pollinate the, the almonds. Because one thing they out that the bees do very well is they pollinate almond trees. And if without a bee, you can't have almonds. So the almonds is, is a is a multi 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 million dollar of business in the United States. And 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 the number of almond trees in the United States is would cover the entire state and more of West Virginia if you put them all together. So a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of almond trees in the United States and they need pollination for bees. And, and how many bees do they need? Well, they need every single bee in the United States needs to go out to the almonds in California in order for the almonds to be pollinated so that you can have your almonds. So so this is a practice uh, after they pollinate the almonds. The almonds out in California, your beekeeper is going to go to different places, Wisconsin, you're going to go up to Maine, you're going to pollinate blueberries, you're going to uh, move the bees all over, they, they're they constantly moving, and and you know what moving does to, to, to humans, it makes you not sleep well, it's it's just not good for the bees, and um, so moving the bees all around like this is, is a uh, very difficult, and it's caused cause the bees more problems. So so not only do they have this problem with all these pesticides and now they're moved all over the country and intermingled with all kinds of bees with all different kinds of diseases, the, the bees just don't have chance. And I could look at the picture here in the lower left corner. This is this is my trailer. Years ago, beekeeper came to me and he said, well, Jean, I want you to buy a bunch of cans of Raid. And when I pull my semi out to bring it to Wisconsin, to do my migratory beekeeping thing, I want you to pull your, I want you to bring your cans of red and I want you to spray all of the bees there and kill them because the landowner does not want a load of bees that are going to be left behind. Well, let me tell you what, I decided instead of killing them with red, I was going to leave my little trailer here. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is a lot, a lot, a lot of beehives here. And I should be able to fit all the bees that are left in that field on this trailer. Well, this is Immediately after the beekeeper pulled out, this picture was taken. This was immediately after he pulled out, okay? As the night progressed, the bees from the fields started coming back. And this whole trailer was covered. And I don't have that picture on here, but the trailer was covered. You couldn't see that there were beehives in there. And you also couldn't see the grass anywhere around it for about 30 feet. So I had to go back in the night and bring more boxes because I wanted to save all of the bees I possibly could. But no way could I save them all. A lot of them died in the night. So this is bees. Now, a lot of people don't understand why the bees make honey. Well, they make it because they eat it. And this is how they, they store it. So when they when they want to make honey, they put honey, they make, start making the, the, the container because before you can store honey, you have to have a jar for it. So they're making a jar. They make a jar out of honey. And the honeycomb has a very interesting feature in that it's built slightly uplifted so that it holds the honey in. So when we put the nectar in there and start working it into honey, it, uh, it won't slide back out. So, so here's a, a, a frame, and they're just starting on it. They've got this piece of plastic that I put in there so that they could have a firm foundation and now they're going to put wax all over it so they can make their container sizes and here they've made the containers it's about an inch it's a half wide and they put the honey in there they dehydrate it and when, as they're dehydrating it oh gosh sorry as they're dehydrating it they're um capping it with wax this is wax and they put wax on it to store it because the wax keeps it from coming out it keeps it safe from critters and um and, and oh gosh, it keeps it from getting moisture in it because honey is very absorbing. So it's gonna pull moisture towards it. So they wanna cap it off with this wonderful wax substance that keeps more moisture from getting added to it. They do all that work to dehydrate the honey, to put it in a form that won't, that won't spoil. Because honey never, honey that's the right humidity will never spoil. So the bees try to put it in that form so that they can cap it off, leave it there, and go back to it later, and it'll still be just as wonderful as it was the day that they made it. So here's how you get the honey out. When you're a beekeeper, you go back and take honey away because luckily bees make way more honey than they could ever consume. So here, you're, I'm putting it in the extractor. You've got to decap it, so you've got to clip off those uh, 
uh, make a hole in each one of those little caps that they've made to hold the honey in. And then you fill this extractor up with these frames, turn it on, it goes around in a circle really fast, the honey flies out, and then it goes through a hole in the bottom into a into um, a honey con a collector, which collects the wax and separates the wax from the honey. And then you take the honey and um, and put it in a barrel and send it off to be bought. So uh, fun, most people don't realize how many they say honey's honey. And I've had a lot of people come up to me at a honey booth and say, "Why would I want to taste honey? All honey tastes the same because people are used to getting it from the grocery store." Well. Um, I hate honey from the grocery store, and I've always hated honey because I, I, I it, because I was used to having that honey that my mother used to buy at the grocery store, and I didn't taste good until I realized my brother's honey. I tasted it, and it was like, oh my gosh, this is the most wonderful thing I've ever eaten in my life. I didn't realize that there were so many different kinds, and honey ranges in color from a light, light, light color to almost black. Now, the darker the honey is, the higher in antioxidants it will be. So your darkest honey made in the United States is the buckwheat honey, and that rivals in comparison to your manuka honey, which is made in New Zealand. The only place in the world that can make manuka honey is New Zealand, and they um, market that honey as being an incredibly medicinal honey. Well, if you go and look at chemical analysis and compare the buckwheat honey with your uh, manuka honey, you can see that the chemical analysis shows that buckwheat honey it rivals in a very big way the manuka. And in fact, you can use the buckwheat honey to heal wounds topically. You can use it to cure your, to um, help your, as a cough medicine. It's actually approved by the FDA as a cough medicine. So honey is wonderful as an antibiotic and an antiviral. So during this time of the coronavirus, I highly recommend that people get uh, a bottle of buckwheat honey that they can take if they get a cough. If you get a wound, you want to be able to apply the buckwheat honey to wounds topically because it's a much better antibiotic than your neosporins. Because in addition to the fact that it's an antimicrobial, it's an antibiotic, it's, you put it on and it's very viscous, so it goes down into the wound and helps to clean the wound out from the inside out. Whereas your neosporin is more topical. It doesn't really, it's so gluey and jelly that, uh, that it doesn't seep into your wound as much. I tell a story about a dog, my dog that my hand, he was a very old dog and he didn't know who I was and I came up behind him. He took my hand in his uh, mouth, the big dog, 100 pound dog, he took me and chewed on my hand for, for several minutes. And when I pulled my hand out, my nails were missing. And he basically ripped all the skin off my hand and it was bleeding, um, which was a good thing that it was bleeding. But I put it in, I was going to race to the emergency and I turned my car around and I said, I'm going to do what I've been telling people to do for years. And I'm going to put my hand in buckwheat honey. So I did. I poured myself a big bucket, put my hand in there and I did this three, four times a day. And um, after three or four days, uh, my hand looked fine. It was starting to heal over. There, it scabbed and there were no scar, no scarring whatsoever. I wish I could show you my hand, but you can look at some of these pictures online. You can see my mother who's almost 100. Who, at 101, she had a surgery that a doctor recommended. No way, no how, you can't operate on her. She's 101, the wound will never heal. But he did operate. A few weeks later, the wound was healed. There is no scar and you can't even tell he was in there. So wonderful thing, honey, for antimicrobial, antiviral. Now let's talk about a lot of people ask me, uh, did you know, they tell me, did you know that honey is good for allergies? And I'm like, wow, you know, gosh, no, I didn't. I'm just, you know, I sell uh, one of the premier honeys for allergies in the world, the local bee honey. I have a patent for my process because one reason that people say that, that honey does not work for your allergies is because it doesn't have the pollen in it that you need. Yes, these are great pollinators, but what do they go pollinate? They pollinate windblown things. I mean, they pollinate things that aren't windblown. So pollens that are windblown are the ones that are bothering you. And what do you need when you want to take something to get rid of an allergy? You need tiny, tiny amounts of it. You eat those tiny amounts of the honey, of the pollen, and then over time you get used to it. Just like a peanut allergy, tiny bits of peanut and you get over the peanut allergy. Same with honey. So I have a patent for inserting these pollens. 
so the pollens that aren't wind that are windblown that the ones that the bees aren't putting into the honey are the ones we'll go out and we actually inject them into the honey and we can make these pollens get these pollens from all over the country and inject them into the honey and using our patented process we make these uh, uh, allergy honeys for all over the world so anyways that's uh, a plug for my company i'm sorry but um anyways um bees fly quite a distance to make their honey and they work really hard to to do this for you and we should try to give them back and plant flowers that they need stop planting grass and let me leave it there and tell you i have a new uh apiary in at the end of rolling acres road in lady lake if you ever want to come out and visit us and if you would like to ask any questions i guess now is a good time great thank you very much and we do have a number of questions um let me just kind of start at the beginning uh, marcia asks how large is the tunnel uh to a ground nesting bee um, do they prefer mulched areas to grass covered sand um, that's a good question. It can vary. It can be a foot long or it can even be a little bit longer. And if you noticed on that one slide, um, it had branches in it. So uh, it, it can actually be quite long. They prefer a um, not a grassy side. They have to dig into it and make a hole. Some bees do have very strong mandibles, especially the ones like the carpenter bees, so they can actually eat into wood. But um, they actually prefer kind of a sandy, location and um, they also need water so sometimes having a little muddy area nearby too is very helpful for them so they can get moisture uh, patty says so the ground nesting bees are what are making these dirt piles with a hole if i smooth them over will that kill the eggs and larva um well it, it, their eggs and larvae are buried into their containers they are going to have to come out and um, it, you might do some damage to the tunnels um, which might make it harder for them um, i hope you don't want to kill them because <laughs> they are beneficial um, but i i don't really know how to answer your question other than it'd be best not to do that okay um vicky asks um does a drone or a worker bee in a swarm explore to find a new site for a hive uh, that would be a, a worker bee because the drones really don't do anything except mate with the queen okay um marcia asks will bees build nests in a palm tree are you asking about honeybees or wild bees um she didn't specify that probably would be more of a honeybee because most native bees either build um, nests in the ground or in cavities. I guess if the tree had a, some cavities in it, they could do that, yes. What about honeybees, Jean? Uh, I've never seen a honeybee nest in a palm tree. Interesting. Of course, palm um, trees aren't really trees. But <laughs> that's not, another well, that yeah, that's a whole other presentation, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Vicki asks, why don't more farmers use local beekeepers to pollinate almonds and other things? And why aren't the hives left and, and continued on those farms? Well, the beekeeper wouldn't generally leave their bees on a farm because it, they're brought in to pollinate a monoculture, right? So that monoculture will bloom for maybe a week or so so you're going to leave your bees there while that's blooming and then you've got to in order to make a living man it, it's really tough for the beekeeper so they've got to gather those bees up and race off to the next area to pollinate so they wouldn't leave them in one spot and as far as why don't they get local beekeepers well um I, local beekeepers do pollinate local crops but there's not enough. Yeah. yeah, there's not what? enough. Like California did not wouldn't have possibly have enough bees to pollinate all the almond. Deals. Absolutely right. And when you um, get these large, large acreage farms, you need hundreds and maybe thousands of beehives to pollinate them. So your local. What, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, once they bloom too, then there's no food for the bees. Right. Exactly. 
Okay. Um, Vicki also asks, is honey sanitized in some way before bottling it? Honey is in itself a sanitization. So basically anything you put in, you can't, honey doesn't transmit bacteria. It is so safe. So no, honey is like an amazing product. It's an antibacterial and an antiviral all in itself. Um, Marsha comments, love buckwheat honey, but never knew about its medicinal use. Um, Clarissa says, I thought the Florida snow was invasive and the pollen was bad for the bees. Um, not, I'm not aware of that. It can be invasive, yes. And most people don't like it in, it, in the yard. But I'm not I'm not aware of it being bad for the bees. I'll I'll tell you what's really, really, really bad for the bees is that Florida jessamine. The yellow flower. That kills bees. Yeah, it's poison. It's it's well, it's poisonous anyways. Mm. Um Patty has an interesting question. How do you control where the bees collect pollen in order to get different flavored honey? Well, that's where picking the bees up and moving them comes in. When when the orange blossoms are blooming, you got to load up your bees, drag them to the to the orange blossoms, set them down in the middle of an orange grove while the while the blossoms are blooming. And then when it's when the blossoms are done, you got to leave because once those are done, it's such a monoculture. There's nothing left. So you you, you got to leave because the bees got have got to make honey. That's that's what they do. And if they're not making honey, they are not happy. So, so yeah, so bees are make honey. That's what they do continuously. So you pick them up and move them to the next thing that's blooming. Um, Forrest is asking what honey might be best to counter COVID-19 and where can I get your honeys? <laughs> oh, definitely go to um, winterparkhoney.com and we're running a bunch of specials right now. And you can buy, there's a special on the buckwheat because that's the one I really recommend. It's not our best tasting honey. It has a very molasses-y flavor. If you want a good taste in honey, the orange blossom, the tupelo, the sourwood, those are delicious. But the buckwheat is the darkest honey we have. And by far, it has the most antioxidants. And if you want to take something for a cough or apply it topically, that's probably your best bet. There's also the buckwheat that has the turmeric and cinnamon in it, which is also a good choice for uh, a lot of people take that one for arthritis. And uh, you'll find that on the winterparkhoney.com website as well. Um, Jean is asking how many hives can be supported by 14 acres? She's thinking about putting some on her country place. Uh, well, that's that's a that's a really tough question because your your 14 acres is not is is not where it, it's typically not where the bees are going to nectar because bees need acres and acres and acres and acres of of things blooming all at the same time, so they're going to go other places. So it's really a matter of looking at aerials around where you are and see what's there, like. Do you have huge areas of palmetto fields? Do you have huge areas of, you know, sometimes urban areas can provide good, good nectaring environments for bees um, because people plant flowers. And, you know, if they plant flowers, bees like that's good. But, but that's a really hard question to answer without knowing what kind of plants are there. Um, and uh, Marsha has a question more specifically about your uh, your location is that the it is at the north end of Rolling Acres Road. Um, South. It's near the corner of Lake Ella and Rolling Acres Road. Okay, so near the corner of of uh, Rolling Acres and Lake Ella. South. I think that would be the south end. <clears throat> Um, Julie asks, is there a honey that is infused with some type of oak pollen that can help with allergies? 
the local bee honey, if you look in the lower left hand of the screen, is infused. It has um, oak pollen and maple and cedar and all kinds of pollen infused into it. Right. Um, Heather says, I thought that Carolina jessamine was toxic to non-native honeybees, but good for native bees. Um, I, I'm not familiar with it being good for, for I know it's poisonous, and I, I didn't think any bees liked it, but I, I can't answer that 100%. It is a native well, plant, and na native bees do like native plants, but, uh, and usually they're pretty smart, and they'll stay away from things that aren't good for them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing. <laughs> um, Carmen asks, uh, if you could repeat which flower you mentioned that was poisonous to bees. Oh, that yellow jessamine? Yellow I think jessamine. They call it Carolina jessamine, I think. Not Florida. I, I think I yeah, missed Yeah, it's there. Carolina jessamine, yes. Uh -huh. um, Marsha asks, uh, when you speak of diversity of plants required, is this primarily to have blooming varieties throughout the year? Yes, yes. Because for one, you'd like a mass of a planting, so it's easier for them to spot. Same with butterflies. If, if, it's, if you have one plant, it's harder if you have a mass or at least similar colors together, like a group of whites or a group group of blues. Um, and yes, you want food for them throughout the year because in Florida, um, they're active, you know, they do hibernate, but they but they are fairly active. And so you need things blooming at different seasons. And, and also uh, think about it like uh, if, if you just ate apples your whole life or if you just ate bananas, well, everybody see those bottles of honey on the bottom of the screen, they all look different colors. Their their chemistry is very different, and what they're what they're made, what the vitamins, and minerals, and everything that's in each of those bottles is very different from the other bottles. So, so it's the same thing as if you know you said, oh, okay, I'm just going to eat apples for the rest of my life, and I'm going to be healthy because apples are good. Well, it's the same thing. Like, oh, I'm only going to eat orange blossom honey for the rest of my life, and and I'll be healthy because that's good. That's not true. They like it. Bees like a, a variety of different sources for their nectar so they can stay healthy. Uh, Emily asks, what makes honey antibiotic and sterile? I don't think, I think that if man knew how bees made honey and how they made it like it is, that <laughs> that, that would be amazing. I know the Chinese sure do try and they pump out millions of barrels of honey that's not really honey every year, um, but they certainly well, it, don't have that. It also, um, in its process um, of breaking down, it creates peroxide, like hydrogen peroxide, which is antibacterial. So right. that's a, it's a breakdown process of it. Um, Stephen comments that there are conflicting answers about the toxicity of the nectar from Carolina jessamine to honeybees. There is very little actual scientific research on the internet that he could find about that. Um, I can tell you that um, I couldn't figure out why all the bees in my backyard died. And then I looked up in the sky and I saw that all of my oak trees have the Carolina jessamine growing and blooming all over them. And I had just split all of my beehives and all of the splits died. Because what supposedly what the what the jessamine does is it kills the first brood cycle. And evidently that's what happened because every single one of my splits died. Um, Emily asks, is big brand grocery store honey that much worse than local farm honey? It might not even be honey. <laughs> right. Something like 95% of all the honey sold in the United States is, is not real honey. Because if you, if you look at the numbers, look at the numbers, the United States produces about maybe 125 million pounds of honey a year. But we consume somewhere upwards of 800 million pounds. So just based on those facts, you would have to admit that most of the honey sold in the United States is not real honey. So where did it come from? Well, you've got to look at countries like the countries that were the biggest producers of honey in the world, 
which is China, who are not allowed really to export honey to the United States anymore. And when that when that when that tariff came onto the Chinese honey, then the Chinese out, the export of Chinese honey became almost nothing. But the export of honeys from other countries filled that gap. And how did they do that? How did they all of a sudden, uh, instead of being a major producer of honey in China, all the honey started coming from all these surrounding countries instead. And that's because the, the Chinese, we know for a fact they make this honey in factories. It's not real honey, but it mimics honey in a very, very, very closely. It's very chemically similar, but it's different in its ability, like you said, to be an antiviral and an antibacterial. And, and, and yeah, I want to point out, I guess I didn't say that very well, but that's, that's the, 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 the feature of the Manuka honey and the, and the buckwheat honey that makes it so special is it, it, it produces, the, all honeys produce the hydrogen peroxide when they come in contact with a bacteria. But, 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 the, but the actual Manuka honey um, can produce, is, has, a, has a feature that, that promotes this antibacterial process um, in, a, in, in, a, in a more advanced way. You have to read through all the chemical analysis of why the, the buckwheat and the manuka kind of are, are cut above all of the others in producing this, this hydrogen peroxide. I just like to make a point too that honey is sugar, so technically it could be something like corn syrup and not really honey. So you have to really be careful of your source of honey because it doesn't legally have to be labeled that. Are, are, am I correct on that, Jean? Yeah. Right. It's like the very few places actually have a definition for honey. So you can write honey on a bottle and there can be no honey in it because it really, you know. Who's 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 monitoring this? You know, there just aren't enough inspectors in the world to inspect every bottle of honey, which is honey has become such a big industry because it's so much in the forefront of our advertising these days. Everybody wants to buy pure raw honey. So so why wouldn't you just write that on your bottle when there's really no checks and balances in anything these days to make sure that anything is is what it what it says? So Joe has a question. Um, can my one yard in the middle of traditional suburban yards help bees? I can't control my neighbor's use of pesticides. Uh, well, I, I, I think that if you make your yard very desirable, you're going to attract them, but you're right. You can't control um, what, you know, your neighbors do. So I, I, I feel like, you know, I'm, have bees and butterflies in my little yard and I think I'm the only one I actually live in a courtyard villa um, and that's a good point you know are you going to lure them there and there they can be killed by your neighbors I don't know what to say I just think that the more we make people aware and the more they see how beautiful uh, our yards can look with with flowers and especially natives um, that you're doing what you can absolutely and I, I can really relate to that because I have the inspector out at my house continuously because my neighbors are so aggravated that I have such a wild yard and um, I don't live I live in Orange County but I don't live in the city limits and I told the inspector I said he came to me and he said you need to mow your grass it needs to be less than a foot tall or something I can't remember what it, some ridiculous number but anyways uh, I told him I said now you know that there's absolutely no grass in my yard. So how can you say that it's not mowed? And I said, well, could you please just work with me here, Jean? Because I don't know what to do. I get calls on your yard every single day. He said, if you could just help me in some way. He said, because you're really not breaking any rules. And so anyway, I got this big sign that says um, uh, wildlife habitat, official United States wildlife habitat, and I planted it in the middle of my yard. And then I put a bunch of uh, cord grass out front to make it look more manicured. So I lined the front of it with cord grass and, and he came back and he said, thank you so much. And, and then a few days later, my neighbors, some one of my neighbors walked by and they said, you know, they said, we're so happy you have a wildlife habitat. 
And I said, you know, we walk by your yard all the time and we just sit here and listen to the birds and the bees. You know? And so I was really surprised that that silly little sign made all the difference in the world to people because they were able to accept it as a wildlife habitat, but they couldn't accept it as a yard. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe has another question. Um, if you provide a solitary bee house in your yard, do they require cleaning or maintenance to continually attract bees? Well, that is a very good question, and I've been asked that a lot. Um, you certainly um, would want to maybe when there's nothing in them, uh, maybe rinse them out with water. I don't think I would want to use any kind of harsh chemicals on them. And there will come a point when they'll have served their purpose and they do need to be replaced. You could, if you can, individually replace the tubes that are in there. Um, that's helpful. And, um, you know, maybe just rinse them out. But you want to make sure that there's no, they're not capped and they don't have the babies in them. Well, and it looks like this is our last question. Um, if bees are building a nest in an undesirable place, I've heard that you can call a professional to remove them safely and not kill them. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, yes, that is correct, but um, it'll cost you a fortune. Hmm. All right. Um, I think that's all of the questions. So, Nini, if you want to close us out, that would be great. Great. Well, um, oh, there was, I, I, I'm sorry, Joe's, there, yeah, was, Joe's. there was one question about um, is, the, is the session being recorded? So you might want to uh, address Yes, we, we actually are recording the session and we will make it available on the website. And um, we um, appreciate everyone for coming. And I believe Joe had um, a survey that you can take. Yes, just as a reminder, we would appreciate it if you could answer the three question survey that will open for you at the end of this meeting. Thank you so much for attending. All right. Oh, is that it? Okay. And yes, thank you so much. This was an experiment, and um, we hope it was. It gave you something to do on a Friday afternoon, and um, it, we will keep in touch and let you know if we have to do this next month. Thank you.